Caribbean Newsline is brought to you by the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. The CCJ delays issuing orders on the way forward for elections in Guyana. Our top story in Caribbean Newsline from Monday, June 24th. From the CMC News Centre in Bridgetown, I'm Don Paris. Good evening. It will be another two and a half weeks before the Caribbean Court of Justice, CCJ, gives direction on how Guyana should proceed with elections following its ruling that the no-confidence motion against the coalition government was validly passed. But before setting July 12th as the date for giving those consequential orders, the CCJ expressed disappointment that the government and opposition had not held discussions to try to reach consensus on the way forward following its initial ruling a week ago. On June 18th, the CCJ ruled that the December 21st, 2018 No Confidence motion against the David Granger-led administration was properly passed with 33 votes in the 65-seat National Assembly. The CCJ, which is Guyana's highest and final court, had also ruled that the appointment of retired Justice James Patterson as the chairman of the Guyana Elections Commission, GCOM, had been flawed. The CCJ had urged all sides to try to reach consensus before the court made its consequential orders. On Monday afternoon, the CCJ met for just under two hours to deal with those orders and expressed its displeasure at the failure of the stakeholders in Guyana to reach some form of compromise that would allow for fresh regional and general elections as soon as possible. CCJ President Justice Adrian Saunders stressed that the matters before the court are of the highest constitutional significance. That the leader of the opposition and the president and their respective council have not met to discuss the issues that confront us. Everybody says these are important issues, but it seems as though the same degree of urgency and deliberation that is expected of that are expected of the courts, um, we don't see them being reflected in the behavior of the political directorate, and that I think is unfortunate. This case puts the court in a very awkward position because we don't want to make political decisions but at the same time we have to see the rule of law we feel that it is our remit to assist in seeing the rule of law observed in guyana but the observance of the rule of law also requires political actors to conform with the rule of law and to demonstrate a spirit of compromise and reasonableness that allow for the rule of law to take effect. Under the Ghana Constitution, elections should be held within three months after the passage of a no-confidence motion unless an extension is granted by a two-thirds two majority vote of the National Assembly. President Granger insists that house-to-house -house registration must be completed to compile a clean voters list for the polls, and GCOM says that can't be until late November. Justice Saunders said, well, on one hand, the court wants as many persons who are eligible to vote to be able to cast their ballots. Another constitutional value that must be upheld is that when a no-confidence vote collapses the government, elections must be held within three months. The CCJ president insisted that a compromise must be found and it is not beyond the political directorate to reach one. Over the weekend, President Granger officially invited opposition leader Barrett Jagdeer to a meeting to be held on a day after the CCJ sitting on Monday to discuss the current political situation resulting from the court's decision and the orders to be given. 
Jamaica's fifth Prime Minister has been laid to rest. Edward Siaga received a grand farewell at a state funeral at the Cathedral of the Most Holy Trinity in downtown Kingston on Sunday, following four days of official mourning in the country. Siaga died in a hospital in the United States on May 28th on his 89th birthday. And emotional moment. The final farewell to former Prime Minister Edward Philip George Siaga. A man for all seasons. Bringing together local and regional dignitaries like musical legend Jimmy Cliff, former Prime Minister of Barbados Owen Arthur, Premier of the Cayman Islands Alden McLaughlin, Premier of the Turks and Caicos Islands Charlene Cartwright Robinson, and Grenada's Prime Minister Dr. Keith Mitchell. Mr. Mitchell went back 36 years, recalling the United States invasion of Grenada in October 1983 and Mr. Siaga's position on the issue. It was a challenging time in the country's history. Edward Siaga had the courage of conviction to take a stand when Grenada was bleeding literally and figuratively. There may not have been a unanimous support for the course of action taken then. But I stand here today convinced that you are acting in Grenada's best interest, and for that, we thank you. The gratitude from Prime Minister Andrew Holness was on a personal note, having worked as an aide to Mr. Siaga. In 2011, when Holness became JLP leader, he had an unforgettable moment. He held my hands and repeated the same thing. Andrew, don't forget the poor. Indeed, all his work has been beneficial to the poor. For former Prime Minister and political rival P.J. Patterson, Mr. Siaga was a titanic warrior, tough on the outside but had a sweet feeling of care and compassion. It's no wonder he won the West Kingston constituency in the 1962 general elections. That would lead to a tenure of 43 unbroken years in Gordon House, a record which may never be broken in parliamentary longevity or numerically by virtue of the innumerable acts and bills still standing in his ministerial name. Out of fear, he brought stability and a sense of security. Out of it, he brought love. By doing so, he not only removed the people from the slum, but removed the mentality of the slum from the people in West Kingston. Then there's Siaga, the family man. His cousin, Metri Siaga, remembered him with nostalgic fondness and read a section of a letter from Siaga's 16-year-old daughter, Gabrielle. You have been my hero and a wonderful father. I'm fa thankful for the experiences and the memories that we shared and for all that you taught me, like how to fly a kite and how to appreciate art and some museums. Daddy. You taught me the importance of education and at times helped with my homework. I learned from you the importance of nature and how to improve my swimming. Treasured memories of Edward Siaga, father, great leader, visionary, thinker, mentor and friend, carving out his place in history, inspiring many generations to come. That report from TVJ's Andrea Chisholm. After the service, Siaga was laid to rest at National Heroes Park, which is also the final resting place of former Prime Ministers Alexander Bustamante, Michael Manley and Hugh Shearer, National Hero Norman Manley, Reggae icon Dennis Brown, Olympian Herb McKinley and several others. Siaga had been the last surviving member of the team that crafted Jamaica's constitution when the country gained independence from Britain in 1962. He won a parliamentary seat that year representing West Kingston and remained in office for over 40 years. Siaga also served as the leader of the ruling Jamaica Labour Party from 1974 to 2005 when he retired from active politics. 
The Antigua and Barbuda government says it will extradite Indian billionaire Mehul Toksky, who is wanted in his homeland on criminal charges, but only after his matter is dealt with by the local courts. India and Antigua do not have a bilateral extradition pact, but authorities in India have been trying to bring back the diamond billionaire under a law that allows Antigua and Barbuda to send back a fugitive to a designated Commonwealth country. Chokski was granted citizenship of Antigua and Barbuda in 2018 and took the oath of allegiance on January 15th that year. And nearly two weeks later, the Central Bureau of Investigation in India filed a case and started investigating him for criminal conspiracy, criminal breach of trust, corruption and money laundering. Speaking on his private radio station over the weekend, Prime Minister Gaston Brown said his country is not trying to harbour any fugitive. His citizenship will be revoked and he will be repatriated to, um, to India. Uh, it's not a case that we are trying to provide any safe, safe harbor for, um, for criminals, uh, for those who are involved in um, financial crimes. And um, I don't want to go any further with that one. We have to allow for due process. He has the matter before the court. And uh, as we said to the Indian government, you know, you, the criminals have fundamental rights too. And um, Choksi has the right <coughs> to go to court and to defend his um, position after he would have um, exhausted um, all his legal options. Coming up in Caribbean News 9, Trinidadians urge not to fear the Venezuelans among them. Stay with us. Welcome to this year's 50th Caribbean Broadcast Union Assembly on the island of San Andres. San Andres is a small archipelago located in between Jamaica and Panama in the Western Caribbean Sea. A lush, exotic island rich in culture, history, gastronomy, and breathtaking scenic views. Known for its beaches and seven colored crystalline waters, the island of San Andres will be proudly hosting this year's event. CBU members will enjoy top-of-the-line accommodations for an unforgettable experience in San Andres, connecting Caribbean nations through this year's 50th edition of the CBU Assembly. Caribbean Vibrations TV, and we are here with the one and only legendary Coco T. How are you doing today, sir? Yeah, give thanks for being here, you know? First of all, thank you for spending some time with us. Yes. Now, you are a veteran in the game, you yes. understand? Yes. Not for respect to you. Yes, give thanks. How important was it when Bujo called you and said, hey, yo, I want you to be here tonight? Well, it is a no-brainer. And this man has been, been such great friends and family for so long. Welcome back. With the United Nations Refugee Agency placing the number of Venezuelan migrants in Trinidad at at least 40,000, there has been much discussion about what this could mean for the Twin Island Republic's society and economy. And while many groups have offered support to Venezuelan migrants, others have criticized the government's migration policy. But David Mohammed of the Nation of Islam is calling on citizens to unite rather than seek to create division. We get more in this TV6 News report. Speaking during a lecture about African-oriented racism in Lavantil this morning, Mohammed said while the migration of Venezuelans in large numbers will bring substantial change to TNT, he urged Trinidadians to not view that as a threat. Because many people have asked me my opinion on whether I believe that the Venezuelans coming into Trinidad would eventually be like the Chinese or the Syrians or the French Creoles as a minority economically power-broking group. 
And my answer was no. Simply because, one, the quantity of Venezuelans is large enough to sustain themselves economically. He said Afro Trinidadians in particular ought not to feel threatened because in his belief, the most pervasive threat to the community lies actually in a lack of internal unity. There has been a call for regional healthcare institutions to adapt to meet the changing needs of Caribbean populations. It has come from Director of the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, Dr. Carissa Etienne, at PAHO's 64th Health Conference, which ended in Trinidad over the weekend. Marie Claire Williams has the details in this week's Newsline Health. PAHO Director Dr. Carissa Etienne says regional health systems need to expand their focus to health and well-being rather than just illness and disease. Addressing CARFA's 64th Annual Health Conference, Dr. Etienne says the current models of healthcare organizations are inefficient, unsustainable, inequitable, and not best suited to address the current epidemiological and demographic realities. We know that we must face up to and address the growing burden of non-communicable diseases as our population rapidly ages. This means addressing the determinants of these diseases, the unhealthy lifestyles of our peoples, poor nutrition, alcohol and tobacco use, and embedding health education and health promotion in all aspects of our daily lives. But we must also adopt healthy public policies to address those risk factors. Dr. Etienne said there is also a need for fundamental change in the role of healthcare networks in the Caribbean, beginning with hospitals. Hospitals need to adapt to the future needs of our health systems. International trends point to progressive care models that are more people and community centered than the traditional model of hospital wards organized by medical specialty. And hospitals need to shift their current organizational structures to embed themselves within integrated and multi-level health networks delivering comprehensive health services and supporting the first level of care. She also made a strong case for universal health care coverage for Caribbean nationals. People should be able to access comprehensive health services that they need based on primary health care when they need them. And it means that people should be protected against financial hardships. No one who needs care should go broke or lose his or her home or decide to forego care because he or she cannot afford to pay. This is happening right in our midst as a Caribbean subregion even while I speak. Mary Claire Williams, Newsline Health. Ahead in Newsline Sport, opening Wendy's batsman Sunil Ambris to replace injured Andre Russell for the rest of the World Cup. Stay with us. Of course, war, war is hell. War is a curse of mankind from the very beginning. And everyone is against war and everyone says they're for peace. So, of course, it's a, it's a terrible thing to die for any reason, but particularly for young men and women to die uh, in battle. Every country has its own way of honoring those who died when you got out how long did it take for you 
where someone finally said, I'm gonna give Sean a break. I'm gonna give Sean a chance and you got your first job. It took a long time. It took a long time. Um, I went into business with family um, and started out doing counseling. And I stopped that because my mom had got ill. West Indies lost their gamble with Andre Russell's fitness when the injury-plagued all-rounder was forced out of their beleaguered World Cup campaign after failing to recover from a long-standing knee injury. The injury-plagued 31-year-old managed just four games of his West Indies six outings and will now be replaced by batsman Sunil Ambris, who was a part of the side's pre-tournament camp in Southampton last month. Russell's withdrawal comes as little surprise despite West Indies' insistence he would continue to feature in the World Cup campaign. The Jamaican has been in visible discomfort throughout the tournament, often hobbling around while fielding and repeatedly forced to leave the field for treatment during matches. He missed the Windies' outing against New Zealand and in his last match against Bangladesh a week ago, also struggled in sending down six overs. All told, Russell managed just five wickets from 19 overs at an average of 20 and made 36 runs from three innings, including a two-ball duck against Bangladesh. Ambrose, meanwhile, will now link up with the squad ahead of Thursday's clash with unbeaten India as the Caribbean side virtually out of the running for a top-four spot after losing to New Zealand over the weekend seek to strong to make a strong end to their campaign. The 26-year-old Ambrose was a member of the squad which toured England for the try Ireland for the Tri-Series, including the hosts and Bangladesh, scoring 278 runs at an average of 92, including a career-best 148 against Ireland. Top-ranked ODI all-rounder Shakib Al-Hassan's five-wicket haul helped seal a comfortable 62-run win over Afghanistan on Monday as Bangladesh's hope of a World Cup semi-final spot remained alive. Al-Hassan finished with figures of 5 for 29 to wreak havoc on the Afghans as they chased 262 for victory at the Rose Bowl Cricket Stadium in Hampshire. Really well played. That's what you want, pace on the ball. Down the ground, and this could well get to the boundary. It might not. In fact, uh, Shakib could run it down with some commitment. No. All right, that's a good shot. That'll help. Oh, I don't think he's timed the ball well. The catch will be taken. Tamim Iqbal, this time he gets... Judges it look much better. And that's why you need to break out with shots like these. Not sure it's timed it as well as he'd like to still go for four. That's sharp work. I think he's won the day. Wish we could bat it exceptionally well. The picture told the story beautifully. And just, just a little chip over mid-off. Well done. Got him. That man in at short cover is such an important factor on a pitch where it's holding up. Oh, lovely. Lovely from Shakit. You just never know which one's going to hold and spin. Habit of his. Now he's got hold of it, but he's found the fielder. Wondering where the run's going to come from. He thought he can slog Shakit. Instead, he delivers him a fourth. Ah! Right now, two appeals. Hang on. Oh, hang on. The running between the wickets is something we will highlight or low light because that is very poor. Right, straight away, Najibullah Zadran comes in and says, Right, that's what I do. Oh, it's terrific flair in that stroke, the dance of the feet. And another boundary. That's a fabulous blow. More of that, please. Gone. A play and a miss. And that champion. 
champion combination do it again. Another wicket, simple as that. Little touch, yes there was. And the fizz has two. And they've won this one. Right on cue, they have won this one. To football action now, Martinique and Cuba suffered contrasting defeats to wrap up their campaigns in the CONCACAF Gold Cup on Sunday. Playing in Group A at Bank of America Stadium, a spirited Martinique went down 3-2 to powerhouses Mexico in the marquee game, while in the undercard, Cuba were flogged 7-0 by Canada. Jonathan David and Lucas Cavallini netted superb hat-tricks as Cuba slumped to their third straight defeat. Cavallini scored his in the first half, with goals coming in the 21st minute, 43rd and 45th, while David opened the scoring in the third minute and added strikes in the 71st and 77th minutes. In the feature game, Mexico grabbed the lead in the 29th minute through Uriel Antuna, which allowed them to lead 1-0 at the break. But Kevin Parsman made the contest interesting when he equalised in the 56th minute, curling in, a, curling in a brilliant free kick from the edge of the 15-yard box. Five minutes later, Mexico were back in front through England-based forward Raul Jimenez, capping off a fluent passing move to tap in from close range. And Fernando Navarro made the point safe with Mexico's third goal in the 72nd minute before Jordi Delem created some anxiety at the end with his 84th minute header, which pulled one back for the French Caribbean side. Reigning world champion Lewis Hamilton dominated Sunday's French Grand Prix to win his fourth straight race and sixth of the season and install himself as heavy favourite to retain his driver's title. Starting from pole, the 34-year-old led from start to finish to take the chequered flag 18 seconds clear of Mercedes teammate Valtteri Bottas and stretch his lead at the top to 36 points. Ferrari's Charles Leclerc claimed the other podium place as the Red Bull pair of Max Verstappen and Sebastian Vettel were a disappointing fourth and fifth. Right, we'll be right back. Caribbean Newsline is brought to you by the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. Welcome to this year's 50th Caribbean Broadcast Union Assembly on the island of San Andres. San Andres is a small archipelago located in between Jamaica and Panama in the Western Caribbean Sea. A lush, exotic island rich in culture, history, gastronomy, and breathtaking scenic views. Known for its beaches and seven colored crystalline waters, the island of San Andres will be proudly hosting this year's event. CBU members will enjoy top-of-the-line accommodations for an unforgettable experience in San Andres, connecting Caribbean nations through this year's 50th edition of the CBU Assembly. You're watching Caribbean Vibrations TV, and we are here with the one and only legendary Coco T. How are you doing today, sir? Yeah, I give thanks for being here, you know? First of all, thank you for spending some time with us. Yes. Now, you are a veteran in the game, you yes. understand? Yes. Not for respect to you. Yes. How important was it when Bujo called you and said, hey, yo, I want you to be here tonight? Well, it is a no-brainer. And this man has been, been such great friends and family for so long. That's Caribbean Newsline. Thank you. Thank you for watching and have yourselves a good night.